Okay, so we're going to take a look at um, just the first basic, most basic shapes. So for now, I'm just going to give them to you, and we're going to get to learn how to manipulate these. So you definitely want a good copy of the sine and cosine function in your notes. So um, let's just start with a copy that we can refer to, and then I'll explain to you um, how it is that I can come up with this graph so quickly, because you'll be responsible for doing the same by the end of our block. Isn't that a good graph? I'm good at drawing these ones. I'm proud of them. Well, normally my artistic skills are pretty terrible, so I'm, this is one thing I think I'm okay at. Seriously, look at that. <laughs> it's like graphing calculator good. Okay, so um, make sure you have a good copy of this uh, sign graph, and we're going to be referring to it for a few parts of this lesson as well as we build on it. Okay, so for the cosine graph, uh, the cosine graph is kind of similar looking. I'll show you again what these key features would look like, and I'll explain to you how it is that I get my picture so quickly. But uh, for now, you just need a good copy of it. And like this. So one key feature of the trig graphs is we call them a periodic graph. Uh, what we mean by periodic is they repeat. So let me show you what repeats in the sine graph. So for example, the first one we looked at here for sine, if I was to trace over in purple, this is the basic shape that gets repeated over and over again in purple. If we were to keep stretching this graph further and further out, we'd keep seeing this purple shape repeated. So again, you can see here's the second one in my picture, it's the identical shape, it's just been repeated a second time. Okay, so these are, uh, that's how we call a periodic graph. And when we know that it repeats, we're often interested in how often it repeats. So the uh, length of one of those shapes, one of those purple sort of just single sign graphs, how far is that? Can you make it out in that graph? So this purple shape here that just goes like that, how far is that purple shape? Two pi. Yeah, it's 2 pi. So that's what we would call the period for this graph. Okay, so since it repeats, we're interested to know how often um, the period for the sine graph is 2 pi. Okay. Now, uh, maybe I'll do the cosine in green. So here's one cosine graph. And again, you'll notice that it is also 2 pi in width. So it has a period of 2 pi as well. Okay. So when we uh, deal with those graphs, we're going to see we can shift this around and change it. But maybe where else have you seen this kind of picture before? Any ideas? Have you seen this before somewhere? Where have you seen Well, other than a textbook, yeah, but where? <laughs> Where else have you seen it? Nothing really? Sound waves? Yeah, that's probably the most common that people say they've seen this. Is like, um, it, I, don't, I don't think we have an oscilloscope here, do we? Anybody know? You'll have to ask Mr. Tennant if we have one. But um, an oscilloscope is, it looks like a really bad television. And when noises go through the microphone, it actually makes these waves to show you what the frequency and, the, and all that stuff is of the voice. So like, as your voice gets higher, the voices, the, the, <laughs> the frequencies get uh, shorter. And as they get longer, they get lower and they bend easier, right? So anyway, um, it turns out that these graphs, anything that repeats in nature, uh, we can model with these graphs. So things like the tides, sunrise and sunset. Um, you'll find that for some reason, the people in our class are obsessed with Ferris wheels. I don't know why. There's so many applications, and Ferris wheel always tends to be the one that, that they pick because a Ferris wheel goes round and round and round and keeps repeating. So anyway, it works for that too. So key features that you need to know about. Um, a center line. Okay. Um, sometimes the center line is known as vertical displacement. So if you hear something really nerdy like that when you're reading your provincial exam in June, 
Then now uh, vertical displacement, all you have to say to yourself is, all right, that is nerd for center line. Okay, so let me show you what the center line looks like on the cosine graph. Okay. So the center line, oops, that's a highlighter. The center line would be right there. Okay, so the way that I could describe the center line to you is exactly half of the graph would lie below and the other half would lie above the center line. Okay, so it makes sense, kind of like the middle. So uh, half of the graph above, I mean it is pretty obvious, but there we go. So another thing that we're going to talk about a lot in trig graphs is the amplitude of the graph. So amplitude refers to how far away the graph goes from the center line. So how far away does this graph go from the center line? One is the farthest away it goes. So that would be the amplitude. We move away by one unit. Now, even though here I'm dropping, it does not matter. We're just interested in how far away it is. So we would not say the amplitude is negative one. We would always just say the amplitude is one. Okay, so this is how far it moves from the center line. So finally, um, minimum maximum points. Um, I'm going to show you just some of the, the key points that we want to look for. But uh, here they are. Here's one of the maximums. We'd find it at 0, 1. Okay, we find another maximum here at 2 pi and 1. Okay. Um, you can see there's a minimum point at pi and negative 1. Anybody maybe guess where they might have seen this sort of thing before? Well, in math class. We've actually talked about it, but it's just hidden in this picture. Like, where is pi and negative 1 and cosine all sort of... Yeah, this is all unit circle stuff, right? Because at pi, at 180 degrees, the cosine is negative 1. So the value is, it turns out to be a negative 1. And that's why I've drawn one graph from 0 to 2 pi, because that's one turn around the unit circle. So all those values you already know from the unit circle we talked about, they're going to show up here on the graph as well. Okay, so um, I'll let you repeat this process on the sine graph above it. So label the center line, the amplitude, and you can just highlight the uh, minimums and maximums. Okay, so I don't think it's much of a challenge. I'll just quickly jot it down on this graph here. Um, my center, exactly where half the graph is above and below, here would be an amplitude. And this time the minimums and maximums have moved a bit, so now I'm at pi over 2 and 1. So think 90 degrees on the unit circle, the sine equals 1, right at the top. Okay. And um, another minimum here, this would be at 3 pi over 2 and negative 1. Okay. And I could label some more, but... We're going to have to be able to locate these on every graph that we draw. That's why we're doing it with the most basic. Okay. So, here's the, uh, the same two graphs. We've just cut it down into one cycle. Sorry, um, EJ, can you shut that door for me? We just cut it down to one cycle because uh, I'm going to illustrate the, this is your survival, the knowledge that will help you survive the trig. See if I can get the lines. So there we go. Um, the knowledge that will help you to survive and graph these uh, when you have to do them by hand. Okay, if we look at these one cycle of each graph, and I cut it into four pieces. Okay. So, for example, this is cutting it into two pieces, and this would be cutting it into four equally spaced pieces. Okay, so I'll show you the four slots that I've created. So here's one, two, three, and four. The reason we want to know this piece of knowledge is if you look at it, that's where it nicks every key point. It hits zero, it hits the maximum, hits the center, hits the minimum, hits the center. 
So that's useful because that's what we like when we do graphing, right? We want to know just the key points and we'll fill in the curve the rest of, of, of the way. So if we do the same thing to cosine, we get the same properties. One, two, and three, four. And again, you'll notice that one, two, three, and four, they all line up to the key points. So that's what's important to us, that we be able to locate the key points and, whoops, one, two, three, four. I know. Three, four. Um, that's how we do it, is we cut one piece of the graph into four. So if we think about it, how long was it for one of these pieces? What was the period for one of those graphs? Two pi, right? So if the period is two pi. Where will you expect to find the key points? How far apart will each key point show up? Pi over two. Sorry? Pi over two. Yeah, you're right. How'd you get pi over two? Divided by four. Divided by four. So that's a tr that's the thing that we're going to be doing is the key points that we're looking for. We have to divide the period by four, and I know that every pi over two, I will see those key points. So if I know where the first key point is, then the second one will be pi over two over, then another pi over two, then another pi over two, etc. Okay, so that's how we can shrink all that, you know, those graphing and those points down to just remembering four intervals and how far apart they're spaced. Okay, so your turn. All I want you to do right now, this is where you should be comfortable with, now that you know to split it into four pieces, and now that you know the pattern, it kind of goes uh, sine and cosine here, see if you can just do a sketch. Okay, test yourself. Don't look at your notes, just try it. Can you sketch the cosine and the sine graph without looking at anything else now? Okay, so I'll walk you through how I would do this really quickly. Now, the sine pattern, as you saw from the previous graph, starts on the center line, which is at zero. Okay, so the next space will be pi over 2 to the right, and it will be up top. Then it touches the center line, then it touches the minimum, back to the center. So here is one period of the graph. Probably took me, I don't know, 25, 30 seconds to draw. So the other half, I'll continue the pattern. Then it's going to go to the bottom, back to the center, back to the top. And this is what I should be able to produce now in about a minute. Okay? Same process for the cosine. It starts at the top, goes to the center, minimum, center, maximum. So that's what it looks like when I do one cycle. If I continued the pattern, then that's what I'd get for a quick cosine sketch. Okay. So we're going to review some knowledge of transformations and see uh, if we can figure out how to move these graphs specifically around. Okay. So for example, and maybe I'll just ask once here, um, this cosine x plus 2, what's going to happen to that graph? Rod, what do you think, Roger? Moves. I thought you mumbled it, that's all. Two up is correct, yeah. So I won't insult anyone's intelligence with these questions anymore. Two up, this would be three down. Okay. So if we think of the way this graph's going to move, that means to us, the center line of that graph is going to move up or down. That's the way we want to think of it in uh, terms of the trig functions. So for example, sine x plus d, the center line will be right whatever this value is. That tells us where the center line is. 